Greetings everyone, Adventures in Vandy here, and welcome back to more Let's Play StarCraft 2, Legacy of the Void this time. Now I want to show some quick uh, tips and tricks as well as go over a lot of the changes and new units for Legacy of the Void. So without further ado, let's get started. Alright, so the first thing I want to show real quick is a Protoss specific maneuver that actually helps a lot with using Stalkers. Now I have 20 Zerglings and 5 Hydralisks versus 12 Stalkers. And if you just let them go at it, then typically the Hydralisks and Zerglings will win. Sometimes they get 3, sometimes they get only one Hydralisk surviving, but the point is that they win. Now if we actually go and use the Protoss Blink Power defensively, and pull back the weakened stalkers before they actually get killed, you end up with a lot more stalkers that actually survive, and you go from something that was about even to now you have up like eight stalkers out of the 12 surviving. So defensive blink micro, as we call it, will actually save a lot of your stalkers in this situation. Alrighty, let's have another scenario where we aren't necessarily fighting anything, but we want to try and get, say, a large army past, let's call this a chasm, just for demonstration purposes. But if you try to blink over just with the regular power, even if you do it well, you might still have some stragglers left on the other side. And you'll have to wait for the cooldown to blink again. Now, in order now to do a maneuver to actually make this simpler, we're going to queue up a few commands with shift queuing. So I'm going to do this really quick at first, but we're going to tell them to move, blink across the chasm, and then move again. And the effect is, you'll have this train of blinking stalkers in order to get everyone past the chasm the first time. So again, the step-by-step -step for this would be to have your army somewhat far away, and then give them the command, the first command to move to the chasm, hold shift, activate the hotkey to blink them across, hold shift, move them again on the other side to get out of the way for the rest of the guys. Once more, move, hold shift, cast blink, move on the other side. Let go of shift at this point. And you can get everyone across. Alright, and so here I'm going to show something off with the sentries in particular. We're going to pretend these are on opposite sides. And this is a small trick that you can do when you're going up against sentries that have the force field ability. Over here I have a small group of adepts, zealots, and high templar. This doesn't really concern the new unit, the adept, but we'll prove my point all the same. Now, usually you have... Protoss versus Protoss, and they put force fields up, you can't actually break up through the ramp. But say you want your attack to... Let's say your attack was very dependent on getting your attack up there now, and even being delayed by a few seconds would be the end of what you're doing. So let's say the enemy puts a couple, couple force fields up, and the enemy Protoss sees that. What they can actually do is anything with the massive tag can actually crush force fields. I have the game paused. So that includes, you know, Ultralisks, Colossi, Thors, and actually Archons also have the massive tag. You can see what tags unit has by looking at their selection down here. So Zealot, Light Biological. Sentry, Light Mechanical Psionic. High Templar, Light Biological Psionic. So let's say... The enemy Protoss that wants to get up here now sees the force fields go down and he has High Templar. Well, he can make a Archon to crush them, but if you need to go there now, you might not have enough time to uh, make your Archon. But as you can see, you can kind of push them around. Why don't we get a couple more High Templar? Let's pretend this Archon isn't here yet. Let's put a couple more High Templar right up here. So we get a couple force fields up, like, oh, we need force fields. And then you can push the Archon while he's still forming to crush the force field. He counts as massive while he's still forming. 
So this is a way to get through force fields as another Protoss. Now this isn't a really representative force as to what you might encounter, but, and this is also more applicable to the campaign than it is the multiplayer, because in the campaign you get the Void Ray's ability to charge up their lasers over time back. So one thing you might want to do is before you go in to actually fight something, you might want to charge up your lasers on, say, a random pylon. And let's just pretend they still have the ability. So as soon as we destroy the pylon, we have our lasers charged up. And then you go in, you're able to wreck what it, whatever it is you're fighting without having to wait for your lasers to charge up ahead of time or while you're fighting it. Again, this isn't part of the multiplayer since now it's an activated ability for multiplayer, but this will still be part of the campaign since the Void Rays that you get there still have this charge up feature instead of the ability. Now one last trick to go over, although it's really not too uh, applicable, is you can actually blink to or use other such transportation abilities to disjoint attacks. So they just attack normally, they're going to kill each other at about the same time. Now if you actually blink and disjoint the shot while it's in midair, you'll actually stop the shot from hitting. So going to disjoint the shot again while it's in midair, and all of a sudden a stalker can win against another one, even though technically they should kill each other. This is not This is a really hard thing to pull off, and most often you'll end up ruining your own attack pattern at the same time, so I don't really recommend it, but it's something to consider. And usually it's easiest to, to do with Blink, but you can also pick up, say, a Siege Tank and do it the same way. It's much more finicky, though. The main point is that you somehow move yourself or go invisible or burrow or something before a traveling shot actually makes it to you. And also you can't really do this with uh, attacks that don't really have an, a bullet that flies through. You might have seen him stop for a little bit, but that's only because I went out of range. So if you want a quick guideline as to what attacks would actually, this would this trick would actually work with and what tax, attacks wouldn't, it's whatever attacks a Raven's point defense drone would actually stop, just for reference. So anything that has an actual bullet to it. And now just on to the new units. First we have the Adept, a ground unit that can actually be built from a warp gate without requiring any sort of additional tech. And she does better damage versus light units, making her somewhat more effective at, say, Zerglings than the Stalker would be. She has a range of four, just like the Zerg Roach, moves slightly faster than Zealots, but not as fast as the Stalkers, and has the Psionic Transfer ability, which sends out a little shade, which after the ability is done, or after the shade times out, the Adept will be teleported to wherever the Shade is. The Shade is invulnerable, and this is primarily so that you can do sneak attacks with the Adepts. I guess maybe not sneak attacks, but surprise attacks that are really hard to prepare for, at least directly. Something like that. And we actually have a new unit out of the robotics facility for the Protoss, the Disruptor, with a Purification Nova ability. Essentially, launching these siege blasts at an enemy, but you have to activate the ability. These do fantastic range and splash damage. Warp prisms now warp in units from some distance away, as makes sense with the whole warping thing. The Protoss Colossus had its Thermolance upgrade range reduced from 9 to 8, a decrease of about 11%. The Oracle had its Revelation and Envision abilities merged into one so that, it so that the power itself will grant vision of enemy units and reveal cloaked or burrowed units. And in place of the third ability, it now gets the Stasis Ward Trap, 
which will put enemies in stasis for 21 seconds. Carriers now have an ability to release their interceptors so that they don't have to do it manually or get into dangerous range for it to for them to actually come out. The interceptors when released this way have timed life. Immortals no longer reduce all damage launched at them by 10. Instead, they get an activated ability to absorb 200 damage, which recharges about every 45 seconds or so. Zerg got a new evolution for the Roach. They can now evolve into Ravagers. And Ravagers have the Corrosive Bile ability. It's effectively letting them siege an area. And they still have a standard attack with a range of six. The Zerg also got the Lurker back. Splash damage in a line uh, ranged unit. Can only attack when burrowed. Corruptors no longer have the Corruption ability. Instead, they have Caustic Spray, which deals seven damage over per second for four and a half seconds and this increases to 35 damage a second making it appropriate for building removal this power can only be used on structures the ventral sax upgrade is upgraded on each overlord individually now more so creating your own transport units and apparently they have an updated model for it too nidus worms can no longer be damaged until they actually unburrow, making it a little easier to actually use them. It's not to say they can't be sniped as soon as they unburrow, though. Brood Lords no longer have their frenzy ability, so they can actually be affected by things like, you know, uh, fungal growth and other abilities that slow or stun units. But at the same time, their, re their range has been increased to 11. Swarm hosts don't have to be burrowed anymore to spawn their locusts. And their locusts can swoop down to attack their targets. This ability does have to be activated manually now, because in multiplayer before, the locusts would spawn on their own. The Terran vehicle and uh, ship upgrades have been separated again. Their armor is still linked, but their weapons are now separate. The Thor has also had its high impact payload ability removed, so now they only have their standard splash damage attack. Terran's got the new vehicle unit, the Cyclone, which has the ability to lock on, and once they lock on, they could continually bombard a target and get out of lock on range. There's also an upgrade, the mag field accelerator, to increase the lock on range. Allowing and this also allows them to move and shoot. Once they've locked on, of course. The Terrans also got a new ship called the Liberator. Much like the Valkyrie in Star StarCraft 1, they do splash damage to air targets. Initially, they cannot hit ground, but they can deploy into a defender mode, which will cover a target area and do great damage basically as an air siege tank. The defender cannot move while in this mode. You can also research advanced ballistics for the Liberator to increase the defender mode range by four. The Liberator cannot attack air in this mode. And the Terran Siege Tank can actually be put in a medevac while in siege mode. There is a small delay for when it can actually fire. And apparently the unit tester bugs out when you try to do this. And that just about covers everything I wanted to cover for the Protoss tips and tricks as well as the multiplayer changes. There's also a co-op mode if 
you and a friend want to use actual campaign units against a AI force. It's really fun, actually. But then next time, we will be stepping into the Legacy of the Void campaign. And I'll do the same thing as I did with Wings of Liberty and Heart of the Swarm, which this will be a complete playthrough, getting all of the achievements. For those of you that are interested, I have actually written a guide now on Game Facts for Legacy of the Void, detailing how to get all of the mastery achievements, as well as all of the bonus objectives, and so on and so forth. But, for those of you that are interested, and want to play Legacy of the Void now, but need some context for what's going on, there is the story so far, which I will play here in a second. But, that... This will cover just about everything that happened in StarCraft 1 and Brood War, as well as the other two expansions that are relevant to what is about to happen. So, as I leave you with this cutscene, next time we will start Legacy of the Void with the prologue missions, Whispers of Oblivion. Until then, this is Adventures in Vanity, signing out. Take it easy. For nearly 300 years... Humans thought they were alone in the Caprulu sector. They were wrong. The Zerg emerged, seeking to consume all in their path. And before long, the Protoss, a highly advanced alien race, began wiping out infested worlds, burning Zerg and Terran alike. A three-way war, unlike anything humanity had ever faced, erupted almost overnight. All the while, a human civil war raged. Marshal Jim Raynor vowed to oppose the corrupt dictator Arcturus Minsk for the betrayal of the woman he loved, Sarah Kerrigan. Ah, uh, boys. How about that evac? Damn you, Arcturus. Don't do this. It's done. Helmsman, signal the fleet and take us out of orbit. Now. Kerrigan. A loyal operative was left to die at the hands of the Zerg. But the Zerg had other plans. They transformed her and unleashed her psionic power upon the Caprulu sector, searching for their real objective, the Protoss homeworld of Ayr. The Protoss were unaware of this danger and slow to respond. Their rulers, the Conclave, had dispatched Executor Artanis to hunt for Tassadar, a commander who had refused to wipe out infested Terran worlds. They crossed paths with a dark Templar mystic, whose kind was considered heretics by the Conclave. Through great effort, Zeratul convinced Tassadar and Artanis that he was not their enemy. Together, they rallied more Protoss from both factions against the Zerg. Despite the Conclave's fury, they achieved significant victories against the Swarm. But when Zeratul struck down one of the Overmind Cerebrates, his own mind was left vulnerable. From his thoughts, the Overmind gleaned Ayr's true location, and the Swarm descended upon the Protoss homeworld with all their might and fury. It was Tassadar who kept the Templar from extinction that day. Using the power of both the Templar and the Dark Templar, he sacrificed himself to kill the Overmind. Ire was lost, but Artanis led the survivors to the Dark Templar's homeworld of Shakuras. Old prejudices were set aside. The Templar were now in the Dark Templar's debt. Without the Overmind, the Swarm fractured. Kerrigan sought control of all the Zerg, even enlisting the aid of old friends and enemies like Raynor, Manx, and Zeratul. Once her rule was uncontested, the Queen of Blades betrayed them all. Billions of humans and Protoss were killed. The Zerg stood unchallenged, but to the relief of all, the war seemed to end there. Zeratul suspected the Zerg had fallen under the control of Dark Forces. He uncovered prophecies stating that an ancient entity, Amon, was attempting to merge Protoss and Zerg lifeforms into an unholy hybrid and that this evil might already have control of Kerrigan and her power. It was during this time that Executor Artanis, hailed as a hero, was made leader of both the Templar and the Dark Templar. As Hierarch, Artanis united both factions and promised to one day reclaim the glory they had lost on Ire. Raynor had vowed to see Kerrigan dead, 
But his retaliatory strike failed. Even his rebellion against Manx's tyranny proved ineffective against the Dominion's propaganda machine. But with the arrival of old friends and mysterious new allies, Raynor revived his campaign against the Dominion, scoring major victories on multiple fronts. But Serator warned him about the encroaching darkness and said the key to stopping Amon was the Queen of Blades. She was needed alive. In a daring raid on the Zerg homeworld of Char, armies from the Dominion and Raynor, with help from Arcturus's son Valerian, used an ancient Zelnaga artifact to neutralize Kerrigan's power and free her from Amon's grasp. The Queen of Blades was helpless. The Dominion wanted her dead. Raynor couldn't allow it. Jam. It's okay. I got gotcha. you. Valerian Minx offered them sanctuary, but his father could not let this opportunity pass. During the raid, Kerrigan and Raynor were separated. Kerrigan escaped, while Raynor... He was briefly interrogated and summarily executed. Kerrigan sought vengeance. She set out to reclaim her position as Queen of Blades. With Zeratul's guidance, Kerrigan gathered the Zerg broods and ruled the swarm once again. Only this time, free. The killing will never stop until Minsk is dead. Kerrigan began dismantling the Dominion's military, one mission at a time. To her surprise, she learned that Raynor was still alive. She chartered a course to Korhal, Minx's stronghold. Despite encountering his best troops and traps, she personally ended his life. But there was little time to celebrate. Amon's plans were still unfolding. Kerrigan left Raynor to rebuild while she hunted her true enemy. Raynor and Valerian Minx set about reforming the Dominion with a just government. With the Zerg and Terrans quelled, Hierarch Artanis saw an opportunity. He declared that the unified Protoss, Templar and Dark Templar alike, would retain ire. Any dissenting voices went unheard amid the hope for reclamation. Zeratul set off alone, searching for the truth, hoping against hope that the Hierarch was not making a terrible mistake.